Well, good afternoon, everyone, and um, welcome to the Atlantic Council. I'm Barry Pavel. I'm uh, Vice President of the Council here and the Director of the Brent Scowcroft Center on International Security. We're really excited um, to be hosting this event, uh, a conversation on the potential threats posed by ISIS and Al-Qaeda and how the U.S. and its allies should be conceiving of these these groups and their affiliates and uh, like groups and also how we can most effectively counter them. Earlier this week, as many of you already know, Iraqi troops aided by Shia militia drove ISIS out of central Tikrit, long a bastion for the group, but despite these gains, there's a very, very long way to go um, in the U.S.-led coalition's efforts um, to, to deal with this group. In the meantime, the U.S. military had to evacuate about 125 special operations forces um, from an air base in Yemen due, the, due to the deteriorating security situation there. Um, and that effectively brought an end to the, uh, at least to most of the U.S. counterterrorism operations against one of the most dangerous affiliates of al-Qaeda, whom I'm sure we'll hear about uh, during the discussion, al-Qaeda in, in the Arabian Peninsula. There's no doubt that both groups, ISIS and al-Qaeda, continue to threaten regional security and that both are capable of perpetrating attacks um, in some form against key uh, U.S. allies and partners in the region and potentially also um, threaten the homeland. In a, in a recent interview, the Special Presidential Envoy, General John Allen, um, addressed this issue, stating that ISIS is an entirely different level than al-Qaeda in Iraq was. They're better organized, their command and control is better, situational awareness of a broader battle space in the region is better, and he said that we should take their threat to the homeland, quote, very seriously, unquote. The Atlanta Council, both the Brent Scowcroft Center and the uh, Rafi Hariri Center have been doing a lot of work, as you might imagine, um, on these and related issues and trying to develop actionable foresight to help guide us through the challenges confronting the region, in particular to the security threats posed by terrorist and extremist groups. For example, at the end of February, we convened about 40 experts um, in this room for an off-the-record war game where we posited uh, two different escalation scenarios by ISIS. Um, very, very senior and impressive experts and uh, officials played various roles in the war game, um, and we gained some insights, some of which are written up in the issue brief outside of this room. We also hosted General Allen for a discussion here on March 2nd on these issues. So this is part of a, a body of work, as you would expect um, the Atlanta Council to be doing. Uh, and so I want to get right to the conversation. This is one I'm really looking forward to. Um, uh, and let me introduce very briefly the speakers. You have their bios, so I, I really want to get to the meat. Um, Bruce Hoffman is here. He is the director of Georgetown Security Studies Program. And he has studied terrorism and insurgency for a very long time, nearly 40 years. Having been appointed by the U.S. Congress to serve as a commissioner on the Independent Commission to review the FBI's post-9-11 response to terrorism and radicalization, he is obviously extremely well equipped to assess uh, current terrorist challenges uh, confronting the U.S. homeland. Bruce Rydell joins us from Brookings, where he serves as the director of the intelligence project there. He retired in 2006 after 30 years of service in, at the CIA, including postings overseas, and was a senior advisor on South Asia and the Middle East to the last four presidents as part of the National Security Council staff. Bilal Saab will moderate today. He is a resident senior fellow in the Brent Scowcroft Center here at the Atlantic Council. He produces a, a range of cutting-edge analyses on issues from U.S. defense strategy and force posture in the Gulf to ISIS. He has uh, about a dozen years of experience in management and consulting um, in analysis on these issues, and so he is a, will be a very well-postured moderator to, um, to uh, structure this conversation. This event is on the record, and we certainly encourage you to um, follow the conversation at AC Scowcroft on Twitter, and the hashtag we're using is AC Mideast. And now I will get off the stage and look forward to the discussion. Thanks very much.
feel like we're sitting at a bar. <laughs> Great. Um, I want to start with an assumption that I think both of you will, uh, will feel comfortable with, which is, and I think it's important to say it right out of the way before we get to the conversation. Until there's a serious treatment of the underlying conditions that gave rise to these two organizations we're going to talk about, we're not going to get very far in the counterterrorism campaign. Is that fair? Well, uh, you know, I almost think that we have to start at least with ISIS, with the military threat that they pose, that we're past the point of addressing the, the underlying conditions of why ISIS arose. So in the long term, yes, but right now I think there's a much more pressing you know, actual threat emanating from the Middle East that has to be addressed. Absolutely. Bruce? Um, this is not the first of what I think will be a series of violent agreements between the two Bruces. Um, <laughs> Yes, the long-term issues need to be addressed, and I would put it slightly differently. Uh, the ideological narrative of Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State needs to be addressed by uh, changes in the situation in the Islamic world. But those are huge changes that are multi-generational, probably. Uh, so we cannot have a strategy that simply waits for prosperity, democracy, and peace to come to the Islamic world. We also need a strategy that deals with the here and now and, and protects us, uh, as well as protecting uh, our allies around the world. So yes, I agree, but that's not the uh, complete strategy we need. We need something that is much more integrated that does all of these kinds of things. Great. Well, I just wanted to make sure we get this out of the way so that we're not uh, criticized for having a narrow perspective on, uh, on the issue. I, I completely agree with you that there is uh, much more that should be done, but these are long-term processes uh, that will be with us for a long time, but there's also an imminent challenge that must be tackled through various means. Uh, why don't we start with history? Um, you know, it's often been said that terrorists are bad students of history, uh, simply because they often don't learn that terrorism as a tactic doesn't work. I can actually think of a couple of instances where terrorism has worked, and what comes to mind uh, as a Lebanese uh, is the Marine Barracks attack of 1983, which precisely uh, achieved the objective of forcing the withdrawal of the US troops from Lebanon even though President Reagan said that he wouldn't, but four months later, sure enough, that's exactly what happened. Uh, but I have a feeling that you have another case in mind, uh, Dr. Hoffman, and I think you mentioned that in your new book. Um, do you mind sharing that with us? Sure, well, and I'll selflessly uh, promote my new book, Anonymous Soldiers, uh, The Struggle for Israel, 1917 to 1947, which the first sentence of the book is, uh, does terrorism work? And I think you've hit the nail on the head. I mean, governments uh, and certainly terrorism's victims always maintain that it doesn't. But if it is so ineffective, why has terrorism persisted as a threat to international security or even and local security for 2,000 years? And why has it become an even more intractable problem in the 21st century? Certainly, the terrorists think it works. And I think it goes beyond just the catharsis of what Franz Fanon wrote about. And that's one reason, and then I won't say anything more about my book why I took this very deep dive to examine how the British government responded to both Arab and Jewish terrorism and violence uh, during the period of British rule over Palestine. And especially towards the end when I argue that obviously the creation of Israel was a product of many different factors, but terrorism was certainly one of them. And certainly I think that was the first post-World War II campaign of national liberation, campaign of terrorism. That, I think, has em been emulated and followed by other groups throughout history. And here, I think, you know, your point about um, uh, Hezbollah and the Marine barracks is even more relevant, because, of course, Hezbollah rules Lebanon right now. So how can you say terrorism doesn't work? Sinn Féin is the most popular political party in Northern Ireland. And of course, Sinn Féin would not be where it is if it wasn't for its alliance with uh, the IRA. So the point is, it may be, as many political scientists say, that in the vast universe of terrorism, 90% of terrorist campaigns fail. Fair enough. I don't care about those groups, yeah. because they're flashes in the pan. They don't have the leadership. They don't have the logistical capability that we see with ISIS and Al Qaeda today that's able to sustain themselves. The visionary leadership that's charismatic, that's able to rally 
its their followers, even against uh, very formidable um, odds to raise money to attract uh, recruits. So for me, it's the 10% of the 5% that actually survive and succeed that are so important, because exactly as you describe with the Marine barracks, that's the lesson that other aggrieved peoples take. Sure. And you can look at the Marine barracks. Uh, Velopulai Prabhakaran, uh, mm -hmm. founder and leader of the Tamil Tigers, not a successful terrorist organization in the end, but he pointed exactly to the Marine barracks as right. proof that terrorism mm -hmm. works. Mm -hmm. Well, fast forward, Bruce, uh, we get to 9-11. Um, you know, there are two theories out there that probably one of the most successful, spectacular cases of terrorism. Or given what's happened afterwards with the loss of the haven and everything else, is this a case where terrorism actually has worked or do you disagree with that? Um, I'm reminded of a famous phrase attributed to Chu and Lai who was asked, uh, what do you think about the French Revolution? And he said, it's too early to tell. Uh, in many ways, 9-11 is too early to tell. Mm -hmm. But uh, from the standpoint of Al-Qaeda, it was a world-changing event uh, at a cost of a half a million dollars, according to the 9-11 Commission report. Uh, they inflicted a trillion dollars worth of economic damage on the United States. Uh, they then uh, precipitated the United States' involvement in what is now the longest war in American history in Afghanistan, and they got a, a bonus uh, courtesy of uh, the Bush administration, a war in Iraq, uh, which uh, could easily become the longest war in American history now, since we're back in it. Those wars are estimated by uh, some, est some experts at having cost uh, $4 trillion so far. So do the math. $5 trillion for a half a million dollars. Uh, if this was a, a business model, I would say that uh, they succeeded brilliantly. And on a dollar for dollar expenditure, uh, we can't sustain this indefinitely. That's why I go back to is it, it's too early to tell. Remains to be seen how the long-term effect of 9-11 and other terrorist events will impact on American foreign policy. There is uh, no question, though, that enthusiasm for foreign adventures in the United States has changed profoundly. What the terrorists really hope to accomplish, uh, at least uh, we think they really hope to accomplish, was an even bigger earth-changing event uh, analogous to the defeat of the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. Uh, that hasn't happened. We have not gone out of business. We are still the United States of America. Uh, whether they ever thought that was a realistic possibility or not, it's hard to say. The other thing I would say about it is look around this city. Uh, this city was transformed by 9-11. We have the National Counterterrorism Center, the Director of National Intelligence. We have the Department of Homeland Security. You used to be able to go up to the Congress of the United States and walk into the Congress and go see your congressman or senator. Uh, try doing that today. <laughs> you, won't get, you won't get very far. You used to be able to walk around in that building. Now you can walk around in a billion dollar underground VIP uh, tourism exhibit, but you don't spend very much time actually in the Congress anymore. I think that the... Um, 9-11 was a world-transforming event, uh, and in that sense, I think uh, Osama bin Laden and Ayman Zawahiri probably feel they succeeded uh, quite well in what they intended to do. Bruce, would you like to add? Well, I mean, two things. You know, terrorists measure success differently than we do. Absolutely. Longevity and sustainability. You know, Al-Qaeda will celebrate its 20th anniversary this coming August. I mean, that in and of itself. Who would have imagined in the aftermath of 9-11 that Al-Qaeda would not only still be here, but in recent years has expanded to some 17 uh, different nodes or networks. They've more than doubled the number of networks they had in, um, in, in 2008. And secondly, I would say, and that's my point, it's not to laud or praise terrorism as a strategy, it's to try to look at it from the terrorist perspective, and they believe it's uh, successful and effective. In Al-Qaeda's case in 2005, which we could say was at least a darker time for the organization or the movement that it is now, they put forth a seven-phase strategy. And they're in the fifth phase now. And when you look back at the strategy they defined in 2005, the first five phases bear a lot of, uh, unfortunately, an, an uncomfortable semblance of reality 
to the way events have developed. So they imagine that by 2020, they will be in what they call the definitive victory stage. I don't think they will be, but this is what sustains them and animates them and enables them to continue to raise funds, to continue to attract followers. And ISIS, I have to say, is following exactly that strategy. Probably that's one of the competitions between Al-Qaeda and ISIS, is that ISIS is actually implementing the strategy while I think Zawahiri right now is playing a little bit more of a long game. Sure. Well, the organization that has actually attacked the United States and killed roughly 50,000 people, and uh, has tried to pull off other terrorist attacks. Um, we're not talking about it as much today. It's all about ISIS. Is that a big mistake, in your opinion? And you know, how, do we, how do we assess the threat, basically, which gets down to, to the heart of this uh, discussion? How do we assess the threats of these two organizations, specifically to the US homeland? Well, I think there's, there's two reasons we don't talk about uh, Al Qaeda. Um, one is, as I said, Zawahiri is being remarkably quiet uh, right. for several months. I, I believe he's playing a long game, a more strategic game, waiting till, till developments are more propitious in Afghanistan, which I think they will be. This is behind the creation last September of Al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent, uh, which I think is much more than a publicity stunt. But it also plays into our own narrative. We always talk about the enemy's narrative, but our own narrative has been that we killed bin Laden and we defeated Al-Qaeda. So that's, if they're quiet, they must not exist. But if that's the case, why was it that even in the limited assets that we began to deploy to uh, Iraq in, um, in August and September, one of the first pivotal moves that we did was to attack the Khorasan group, whom no one had ever heard of. Right? So if al-Qaeda was dead, who was Khorasan? Why were sort of people we would have called al-Qaeda senior leadership, which many officials in the administration were saying we had killed all of them, well, who was Khorasan? It was al-Qaeda senior leadership that had moved to, uh, to, to Syria and were believed to be planning attacks, uh, in, at least certainly in Western Europe, because the geographical uh, access is much greater, but perhaps uh, further afield. And even today, at the time we claimed that we killed, or in November, actually, I should say, that we killed uh, Musa al-Fadli, the leader. But now the suspicion is raised whether he was actually eliminated. Certainly. The French turncoat, uh, David Drusian, is still alive. We also had claimed for a time that we'd killed them. So Al Qaeda is still there. I don't think we should completely discuss. Certainly, AQAP is still there and was behind the Charlie Hebdo attack. Um, today, they just released 300 prisoners from a jail. So doubtlessly, they'll, they'll be unmolested without a, a Yemeni government, without a US presence there. Um, their potential, I think, ability to project forces at war probably increases. And then I'll say the last thing. Last spring, the kind of meme in Washington was that the split between ISIS and Al Qaeda was a great thing, that these two groups would somehow neutralize or paralyze or eliminate one another. And that's a fundamental misreading of the history of terrorism, because what we've seen repeatedly is that when there's intense competition between terrorist groups, eventually their attacks always turn outward to prove their bona fides, to trump the rival, to gain an upper hand in terms of recruits and money and support. And I think that pattern, unfortunately, will continue. So even if Al-Qaeda is quiet right now, I don't think we can completely discount them. Bruce? I think that um, the Islamic State, by its uh, actions and by its very, very effective communication strategy, um, <laughs> eclipsed Al-Qaeda in the, in the American media. Uh, but like an eclipse, that's a very temporary and transitory uh, event. Um, I agree with uh, Bruce that Al Qaeda remains a very serious threat. The, the reality is we have two now very, very serious threats, Islamic State uh, and its various uh, vilayets, uh, which have grown quite remarkably and quite quickly in Egypt and Libya and may grow in other places in the future, and Al-Qaeda and its core uh, franchises, even the ones that have been heavily hammered uh, in Somalia, for example, are proving again today that they are far from a spent force. Uh, I think it's a fun to, um, to project out for a minute. Uh, let's think of where we are in 20 months from now. Uh, we have a, a newly elected American president uh, not yet uh, um, in office, but newly elected. If we stay on the course that we say we're on, uh, in Iraq, uh, surely 20 months from now, Mosul should have fallen to our Iranian allies, uh, who are definitely 
uh, eager to fight the Islamic State with our assistance. Um, I'm not saying that the war in Iraq will be over, but I think there is reason to believe that the concentration of forces that exist there should achieve some of their military objectives in the next 20 months. Uh, that will make the Islamic State's core operating area, Iraq, uh, look much diminished. Will they go underground? Will they do what Al-Qaeda in Iraq did back in 2005 and, and operate a very effective insurgency against the Iraqi government? Probably. They will, of course, still have a, a base in Syria, and they will still have their, their North African affiliates. But they will look to be a diminished force. On the other hand, if uh, we stay on the course that we have said we are going to pursue in Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, 20 months from now, the last American uh, combat forces will be leaving Afghanistan, uh, and not so prominently, the last American drones will be leaving Afghanistan, meaning that the Al-Qaeda core, Al-Qaeda senior leadership, Ayman Zawahiri and the rest, will be under much less pressure uh, than they've been for the last decade. In fact. The only real pressure they'll be under is the scrutiny of the Pakistani Inter-Services Intelligence Directorate, which I don't think scares them very much uh, to be under that kind of scrutiny. Their affiliate in Yemen, you've alluded to it, both of you, um, barring a very dramatic change in the situation in Yemen, which is like saying, barring the sun coming up tomorrow in Yemen. Yemen always has dramatically changing situation. But where we are today, uh, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula is looking at basically taking over a substantial part of the most eastern part of the country. Um, and while there's a lot of bombing going on in Yemen, nobody seems to be bombing their uh, facilities at this stage. So you could see in 20 months from now, the Islamic State uh, being eclipsed by Al-Qaeda uh, back in the media, back on the forefront. But the bottom line is that both of them will still be very, very serious threats. And a comprehensive and holistic strategy to defeat them uh, will be, I think, the challenge of the next president. Dr. Hoffman mentioned it. Uh, I know you've been trying to send emails to Mr. Zawahiri, but he hasn't been responding. But if I were to ask you to guess why he's been so quiet since September of last year, what would be your guess, both of you? Uh, well, the honest answer is we don't know. Uh, let's rule something out. Is he dead? I doubt it. Uh, Al-Qaeda uh, is a martyrdom uh, glorification organization. If the emir of Al-Qaeda was dead, I think they would tell us uh, that, he had, uh, that he had passed away. Um, I tend to, to agree with what uh, uh, Bruce alluded to, which is he's biding his time. Uh, I think uh, he thinks the Caliph Ibrahim uh, is uh, an irritating uh, rival, much like uh, Abu Musayb al-Zarqawi was, and that if he waits long enough, uh, the United States Air Force will eliminate this irritating uh, rival, and then he will issue a statement um, saying, I told you so. I told you it wouldn't work. But it's purely theory. I mean, we don't know. And unfortunately, I, I suspect he'll never give us a good explanation when he comes back on the air. Is there any logic behind it? Well, <clears throat> you know, Zawahiri has been unpredictable recently because when he finally issued a statement, uh, last January about the, the split in ISIS. He didn't talk about ISIS at all. He rather talked about Al-Qaeda's own ambitions and its expansion. And even in September, uh, he announced the creation of Al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent, um, which, which I think sur surprised everyone. And he said at the time that this was two years in the making and two years being developed. Whether that's true or not, what I think it does suggest is that this is someone who's enormously patient, uh, who understands that Al-Qaeda has suffered a number of setbacks in recent years, not least uh, the loss of its founder and, uh, and first emir. And he's making sure that Al-Qaeda's next moves will be able to sustain the movement um, and also gain ground against ISIS. And that doesn't mean that Al-Qaeda is inactive. It just means that 
like for all terrorist organizations, is that they have to succeed. Otherwise, they don't terrorize anyone. Otherwise, they don't get any support. So I think that in that sense, the stakes are much higher for Al Qaeda core. On the one hand, to do something that's successful, but I have no doubt that there are constant plans in the work, works, how good we are. And I think we've been very good in interdicting them and preventing them. But we're, as anyone knows, you're not going to have a perfect record ad infinitum. Um, and also, I think it does have to do very much with his efforts to remake Al Qaeda into something that's not just an Arabian Peninsula phenomenon, as it once was, and drew most of its support there. I mean, he's clearly trying to put a South Asian face on it. it makes perfect sense. India has the second largest Muslim population in the world. Why not tap into that? We've seen how, behind the scenes, Al Qaeda has, just in the past 18 months or two years, the core, has been showing more and more interest in places like Burma and the Maldives, where they really had no involvement in the past. And now they're re-engaging in places like the Philippines, Malaysia, and Indonesia as well, and trying to rebuild their networks there. So again, this goes back to my earlier point. I think the stakes are so high for Zawahiri and Al-Qaeda Corps is that, you know, and they all, always believed the time was on their side, that he's just playing the long game. Please. Bruce has prompted two other thoughts in me. Um, it is seven months now, and there is chatter in the jihadist internet world. You know, where is he? What's going on? So there is pressure here to, to uh, appear. But his announcement last September of al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent um, was followed within, I think, two weeks by what may be the most audacious Al-Qaeda plot ever, mm -hmm. uh, which was to uh, hijack a Pakistani naval ship uh, named the Zulfikar, uh, which is a quite advanced um, frigate uh, equipped with ship-to-ship uh, -ship missiles. The intention of, of Al-Qaeda in the Islamic in the Indian subcontinent was to hijack the ship, the Zulfikar, by infiltrating uh, the crew. Uh, and they had succeeded in doing that. Uh, several officers in the crew of the Zulfikar were, in fact, uh, Al-Qaeda members. And the plan was to uh, hijack the ship, take it out to sea, while it still appeared to be a ship of the Pakistani Navy, and then um, put it inside the um, uh, squadron of coalition ships that is fighting piracy uh, in the Gulf of Somalia, uh, and come up close to an American ship and fire their ship-to-ship -ship missiles. I'm sure in their wildest hopes, it would be an American aircraft carrier. Now, uh, the whole plot may have been a, you know, a bridge too far. It may have been fanciful. Uh, whether they could actually control a ship with the number of, of recruits they had, how the Pakistani Navy would react, all those questions are legitimate questions. But from the standpoint of audacity, I would say this is the most audacious Al-Qaeda plot ever, even bigger than 9-11. Had it succeeded, uh, they would have provoked a naval war between the United States and, the, and Pakistan. It would have been hard not for us to respond immediately. Uh, and how would we know how much of the, uh, of the Pakistani Navy was in the hands of Al Qaeda? So you can say, on the one hand, it's a fantastical, could never have succeeded. And I won't argue with that. But on the other hand, in the history of Al Qaeda, this is the, this is the Al Qaeda core doing what it has always striven to do best which has come up with plots that don't behead one person on television or take over the village of Kobani that nobody had ever heard of before in the history of the world, but which are world-changing events. Now, if that's what they were working on last September, what are they working on today? I assume something equally audacious, if not even more audacious. I hope you're wrong. The President of the United States calls you, Bruce, and he promises that this is not for another Pakistan review. He wants your opinion about what we've learned over the past 14 years since 9-11 about the adversary and perhaps what we've learned about ourselves. If you had three things in mind that you'd tell the President, what would those things be? Same question for you. Um, we need a holistic approach. Uh, 
And he knows this. Uh, and when he came into office in 2009, he sought to implement it. On the one hand, we need to use hard power. Uh, we need drones. Uh, we need uh, SEAL teams. Uh, we need to uh, go after the terrorists, find them, and, and if at all possible, capture them and interrogate them for information without torture. Uh, and if not that, then take them off the battlefield. Uh, at the same time, we also have to have the, the, what you discussed at the very beginning, uh, a, a policy that seeks to change the narrative. Uh, we need to be seen as a supporter of progressive reform in the Islamic world, not as the closest friend of an absolute monarchy uh, dedicated to reaction and counter-revolution. We need to actually do something about a two-state solution. Not talk about it, but do something about it. Now, here's where I would say I think we should uh, give the guy in the Oval Office a little bit of a break. Those things aren't that easy to do. Uh, I, you, you know, uh, resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, I've uh, spent an inordinate amount of my life attempting to do so, and I can't claim a whole lot of success. In fact, I can't claim any success. Uh, so I'm very sympathetic to John Kerry and Barack Obama uh, not being able to do that. Last thing I would say here is that a lot, not all of our problems in dealing with Al-Qaeda in the Islamic State, but a substantial part of the success both organizations have had is due to a phenomenon that was outside American control, and that was the Arab Spring, the subsequent failure of the Arab Spring, and the success of the uh, counter-revolution, and the destruction of at least uh, three states, uh, Syria, uh, Libya, and now we're seeing Yemen, added to the destruction of a fourth state that we had helped to precipitate in Iraq in the decade before. Uh, it's awfully hard to fight terrorist movements when you are seeding huge quantities of the globe uh, to become chaotic, failed zones. American control. I think we can do a much better approach on the holistic approach, uh, but this is clearly, clearly going to be a long game. Well, enough of the first time I find myself uh, agreeing with Bruce Rydell, uh, but so let me take a slightly different slice of it, because in the main I agree uh, with everything. Uh, let me sort of focus on maybe more lessons. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly, it's probably a mistake to invade countries and have large-scale military commitments, although I'm not sure that they ended as badly as they had to have ended. But putting that aside, that's not a reality in the future. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that America shouldn't lead, and it doesn't mean that military force doesn't have a utility in the war against terrorism. I think it's part of, as Bruce described, having a holistic strategy, but one that involves both kinetic and non-kinetic means. That leads to my second point. I mean, we have pursued a predominantly kinetic approach to counterterrorism. And I think in some respects, especially in recent years, the strategy of decapitation has failed. Mm -hmm. The terrorist problem worldwide today is much worse right now than it was in 2008 or 2009. Decapitation, I think, is one tactic to use, but I think we elevated, to a, we elevated it to a strategy and to an obsession. I think that it's just as important and even more critical is to go after the infrastructure, and this is going back to core counterinsurgency theory as well, so it's the infrastructure that sustains terrorism and insurgency. We clearly have not degraded the infrastructure. Otherwise, ISIS wouldn't have risen as quickly as it did. Otherwise, Al-Qaeda would, would have withered on the vine and gone away because of the hammering that we delivered it uh, with the decapitation strategy. But again, I think we put too much emphasis on decapitation and not enough at uh, dismantling um, the infrastructure. And the third thing is that, for me, the biggest game changer in Al-Qaeda over the past decade was the creation of franchises. Mm -hmm. Almost without exception, NAQIS is the exception. 
all the group, those 17 or so groups that have gravitated to Al-Qaeda over the past six or seven years existed on their own, were completely independent, and chose on their own to affiliate or ally themselves to hitch their fortunes to Al-Qaeda's star. So eliminating, and that was also one of our problems, is we constantly told ourselves that what was going on in Iraq, or what was going on in the Levant, or in Libya, or in Somalia, or in Nigeria, or in Yemen were all local problems. And they're not, because the franchises is what is empowered, sustained, um, and really, I think, contributed to Al-Qaeda's longevity. And here we've made the exact same mistake with ISIS. For months, we were saying ISIS was a local phenomenon. And what we failed to understand is that the franchising has become one of the driving forces behind terrorism today. And even if ISIS was preoccupied with events in Syria and Iraq, we should have anticipated, just based on the fact that the only difference, between, in my view, between Al-Qaeda and ISIS is when the caliphate can be established. In Zawahiri's view, it has to be after the apostate regimes are overthrown and US and Western influence is eviscerated from Muslim lands. In Baghdadi's view, is why not now? And it was a very bold, bold move. But we should have anticipated that just as groups self-identified and reached out to Al-Qaeda as sort of the, you know, the brightest star in the firmament right now, as Bruce has described largely because of very dramatic beheadings and use of Twitter and just a very strong media presence, which consumes our attention. You know, we're in many respects led by the nose by terrorist groups and some, mm -hmm. you know, we're focused on ISIS because they're in the media and we, neglect al-Qaeda, sure. but as I said, al-Qaeda still is a threat. But this whole thing that I think will transform the ISIS struggle is now we see the creation of franchises. And if you look at Dabiq, their, um, their own online magazine, which of course is a, you know, a ripoff or a panegyric to uh, inspire in al-Qaeda documents, the latest issue of Dabiq is focused on Africa. Sure. And is praising Boko Haram's um, affiliation, is taking credit for the attack on the Bardo Museum. And when you have these independent groups affiliating with ISIS, now all of a sudden, firstly, you're contributing to ISIS's longevity, and you're also giving ISIS an international capability that it didn't have before, just like Al Qaeda's developed it. So we're really in kind of a mess, largely because of franchises, that in some cases, too, the leaders may announce their fealty to one emir or another. But I think the rank and file, just as we saw in Paris, you know, you had Charlie Hebdo, where the perpetrators are identifying with AQAP, and then you had the attack on the kosher restaurant or kosher food market, where the perpetrator is self-identifying with ISIS. I don't see a contradiction. I think what it is for the rank and file, both are great. I mean, again, because as I said, we sometimes think the, the differences between them are greater in fact than they are. I think it's more of one of timing. And that becomes the real challenge, is that the rank and file see both of them are great and are waiting to see who surmounts the other. So to close the loop on the lessons <coughs> learned, uh, on the bureaucracy of counterterrorism since 9-11, uh, obviously you both know that a lot of reforms have been initiated uh, with the 9-11 Commission and then moving forward. And now we have a new Director of National Intelligence, even though we all know that the CIA is still in charge. Uh, any lessons learned there uh, before we move on? Well, what have we learned? We're, what we're doing better? We're doing worse? Well, the one thing that I'm particularly heartened about uh, in the past six months or so is that you know, three of the central agencies in the war on terrorism organizations have all sort of stepped back and realized they have to change to adjust and adapt to what is, after all, a highly fluid and very dynamic threat. So uh, the DCIA, John Brennan, has announced a reorganization of the CIA. Um, the head of the National Geospatial Agency has similarly announced a, a different vision. And of course, the commission that, that, that I just served on that was uh, um, looking at FBI responses, certainly Director Comey is on board with you know, the vast majority of the recommendations to reshape the FBI in a very different way, away from law enforcement to becoming even more intelligence driven. So to me, that's enormously positive. It's when you have ossified bureaucracies, which arguably I, well, I'll step back from that. Let's, let's put it this way. When you have ossified bureaucracies against a dynamic threat, you're always going to be fighting yesterday's war. So these developments within the six months, to me, are at least enormously encouraging. And as you know, I'm not easily encouraged by many things in the war on terrorism. But, but th this, I definitely think, is a bright spot. Bruce, we're doing better? Um, some things we're doing better. Um, I agree. The, uh, a dynamic thinking response on our side is very important. Our defenses are better. Uh, 
at a cost. Uh, we, we've lost access to parts of our government, as I said earlier, but our defenses are stronger. Uh, why uh, any terrorist group would go after airline security uh, is a mystery to me because that's where we've spent more effort than anywhere else. Uh, and there are other areas where we've spent very little effort, which would be much uh, more lucrative targets. Um, but on the defensive side, there is no question, not just the United States, but allies like the United Kingdom and others have done, a, done an awful lot. I've already said, I don't think on the ideological side we're doing very well. I think our biggest problem, in addition to the franchises, or to, or to turn the franchise argument just slightly differently, is the attempt to prevent the development of strongholds and safe havens. Uh, when we were attacked on September 11th, Al-Qaeda essentially had one stronghold, Afghanistan, Pakistan. Uh, it had something else in the Arabian Peninsula that wasn't quite a stronghold, but was uh, important. But it was essentially had that one stronghold. Uh, now it has strongholds across, uh, across the Islamic world. Our success rate in striking down those strongholds has, has really been very, very weak. Um, even the ones uh, where you could argue we've made the most progress, uh, Indonesia, for example. Uh, there are disturbing <laughs> indicators in Indonesia that that will also prove to have been temporary and that Indonesia will again become a, an operating base for uh, jihadist terrorism. So I think you, know, we're, you can't say it's entirely a negative picture. And some of this, as I said earlier, is out of our uh, hands uh, to control. Uh, but uh, it is a very disturbing picture, and the proliferation of franchises and strongholds uh, poses a very fundamental question for the American counterterrorism community, which is where do you put your resources? Uh, there are a finite number of good counterterrorist case officers. There are a finite number of drones. Uh, where do you put them? Uh, what do you consider the threat to the homeland that deserves the highest priority? If you make a mistake on that uh, resource division, uh, results can be catastrophic. If you put all your eggs into we're, we're going to stop the Islamic State in Syria and Iraq uh, and draw down uh, what we're doing in in Yemen, don't be surprised if Christmas morning you have a very unpleasant surprise in Detroit. Uh, these are really hard decisions to make, and I don't think we should trivialize them and say, you know, we have a, uh, we're not doing well. We're not doing as well as we could for a lot of reasons, including this is a really, 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 really hard problem. The last thing I want to say about that is one mistake you should surely avoid is premature declaration of victory. Uh, every director of central intelligence, uh, with the exception of David Petraeus, has uh, at one point in his career announced the strategic defeat of Al Qaeda. Uh, David Petraeus didn't have enough time in office, uh, <laughs> so we can't really measure whether he would have said it. I tend to believe. Uh, he's smart enough not to have fallen into that trap. But premature declarations of victory or the demise of Al-Qaeda uh, is a self-inflicted wound that we seem to do uh, all too often. You mentioned Yemen. We seem to have lost our eyes in the country because of what's happening with the conflict. And I wonder what, what that means for global counterterrorism capabilities of the United States. Well, so we don't know. I mean, we, there might still be some kind of presence, but it sounds like it's been drastically degraded. Well, when the embassy's closed, of course, the CIA station goes with it, and with the U.S. Uh, special operations advisors removed, uh, we still have you know, doubtless forms of technical intelligence, but still, I think the granularity of counterterrorism means you have to have something somewhere on the ground, and I think. 
we shouldn't underestimate the threat coming from Yemen from AQAP. It was only, what, a year and a half ago that we closed two dozen US embassies and consulates across the Middle East and North Africa because of credible threats, which we, we did, had no idea what the threat was. We assumed it was against embassies and consulates. And I think unmolested, uh, as Bruce described earlier, in the eastern part of, uh, of Yemen, AQAP will only you know, look longingly at opportunities to project force and to engage in attacks to enhance their credibility and to gain more support in what it hopes you know, would, would eventually become an effort to dislodge the Houthis or their rivals. Saudis and the Omanis for better intel? Uh... Um, we, we will become increasingly reliant on the Saudis. Uh, the uh, technical means uh, will still be there, but will be much degraded by the lack of a presence on the ground. The, um, you know, much now depends on the efficacy of Saudi Arabia's war against the uh, Houthi Salah Alliance. And I emphasize uh, Yemen is a very complicated place, which is why it's so fascinating. Uh, but we are not, the Saudis are not just fighting the Zaidi uh, sort of Shia uh, rebels, because even that's a complication. Zaidis are not the same kind of Shias as, as Iranian Shias. Um, much of the success of the Zaidi Houthi movement in the last six months is more due to Ali Abdullah Saleh, the former president of Yemen, uh, than it is to the Iranians. Uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh, uh, this is all much clearer now than it was even a few months ago, um, worked secretly with the Houthis to ensure that key military units of the Yemeni army and air force defected over to the Houthis at key moments in their advance across the country. It wasn't Iranian support that delivered Sana'a into the hands of the Houthis. It was Saleh working behind the scenes that essentially delivered the military units that run the capital. And I think what we may be seeing in Aden today is, a, is that phenomenon happening again. The, the loyal, so-called loyal garrison has gone over to the side of the Houthis largely because of Ali Abdullah Saleh. That's not to say the Iranians aren't up to no good. I'm sure they are up to no good. Uh, but I don't think they're the driving force here. If at the end of the day, and I mean that literally today, but also maybe in a couple of weeks from now, uh, it's clear that the Houthis and, and the Sali uh, forces uh, now control the country, or at least all of its major cities, uh, and the Saudis have failed in their effort to prevent that from happening. Uh, that's very dramatic. That's going to be a very dramatic moment. Uh, particularly for the new king of Saudi Arabia, uh, because it will look like on his first major foreign endeavor, uh, he's uh, struck out. Uh, it'll be even more difficult for his son, uh, the Minister of Defense, uh, Mohammed uh, bin Salman, uh, who is, uh, there seems to be an argument over how old he is. Uh, anywhere between 30 and 35. Anywhere between 27 and 35. Uh, I tend to believe that his own biography is probably right. I mean, he says His biography says he's 34. I don't see why he would mislead it. But there is an argument uh, over how old he is. What we do know is he's been Minister of Defense for one month, and he's already gone to war. And if he doesn't turn out well, uh, this, is a, this is a pretty big setback uh, for the kingdom. And since, rightly or wrongly, we have attached ourselves very, very closely to this campaign, for a, a lot of reasons. Uh, it would have been very difficult to distance ourselves from that game. It will also look like a failure for us. And while the, most of the attention is on the, the war between Hadi and the Houthis, uh, as we've all agreed, there's the sub part of this war, which is Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula grabbing as much leftover territory or operating as much leftover territory as well. The one country that's absent from the scene, you've mentioned it, is Oman, uh, which uh, uh, has a long border with Yemen. 
Uh, unfortunately, the Sultan of Oman uh, is probably uh, in his terminal days, uh, if not uh, weeks, maybe. Uh, he spent the last, better part of the last year in, a, um, uh, in his uh, palace in Munich. Uh, it's not really a palace. It's kind of a uh, uh, hospital uh, for him. Uh, he returned a week ago. Uh, he has said nothing since he's returned. He hasn't spoken to his people. He hasn't even issued a statement uh, since he returned. Uh, he is widely believed to be dying from cancer. We don't know that. Uh, just as an amusing aside, Omani Television announced when he returned that he returned thoroughly cured from his illness, which was the first time Omani Television had admitted that he'd been gone for eight months with an illness. So uh, you can't really take that claim all that seriously. Um, Oman is critical to a successful strategy of containing the Yemen problem but it doesn't look like it's about to be a player in any kind of strategy like that right now while well, it goes through what will be a very interesting succession process. So short answer is Yemen is a mess. Uh, it looks to be an even bigger mess in the weeks ahead. I don't see any dramatic reversal taking place, but I know enough about Yemen that a lot of dramatic things will happen and they will be very unpredictable. How much the United States can influence all of this, I'm pretty skeptical. Well, I mean, I have a feeling that when the bullets stop flying, everybody's going to head to Muscat for peace talks, but that's just my opinion. Uh, I want to go to Q&A, but before that, just very briefly for both of you, are we getting enough from our Middle Eastern uh, partners in terms of the counterterrorism campaign? And there are different partners, different per preferences, different capabilities. So you can pick any and you can tell me whether you're disappointed or you're happy with what you're getting. Either of you. I mean, some of them are, are very, very helpful. Uh, having explained the difficulties Saudi Arabia is facing, uh, the uh, plot to attack Chicago uh, in 2012 mm -hmm. with the, the bomb and the computer was thwarted by Saudi intelligence. Um, the plot to uh, uh, put a bomb inside in a, a human being was thwarted by Saudi intelligence. Saudis have certainly done a very good job of Al-Qaeda inside the kingdom. Uh, I'm not sure it's as complete as Mohammed bin Nayef would like us to believe, but <coughs> it's done an effective job. The Jordanians are clearly helping us quite a lot. Uh, Jordanian intelligence... Um, plays a key role in, in both Iraq and Syria, uh, mostly unreported, but a very important role. It's much harder for me to say about um, the Egyptian government, the new Egyptian government, what kind of a role they're playing. Uh, I suspect they're mostly giving us information about uh, participants in the Muslim Brotherhood and things like that. It's spotty. It's spotty. Uh, the places where we really need help Libya, there is no government. Uh, Syria, <coughs> we're not going to go to the Assad regime, nor, sh nor should we do, nor should we go to the Assad regime. Iraq, uh, I, I, I no doubt that they are giving us all the information they have about the Islamic State, but I'm sure that a lot of that includes any Sunni who they don't like. Uh, that's kind of the nature of intelligence liaison with these kind of regimes. It's, uh, it's messy, to put it mildly. Fair enough. All right, let me turn it over to Q&A. Um, state your name, affiliation, if you don't mind, and a brief question so we can get as many as we can. Uh, why don't we start in the far left with the lady? Thank you. Um, my name is Marwa El Sayed, and I work as a news anchor at the uh, Hora TV station, and I'm a graduate student as well, studying terrorism. Um, I have two brief questions. One, you said uh, the strength of ISIS lies in it being a franchise, acquiring territories, even if it's irrelevant, like Kobani. Um, what about recruitment? Do you think it's one of their strengths that they are uh, recruiting more fighters uh, from outside the Iraq and Syria region? 
That's uh, number one. Number two, do you think the media, um, by focusing on ISIS and reporting their news, their tweets, their videos even, indirectly help them accomplish their goals of inflicting fear of, on the public and having more adherence? Thank you. Well, I don't, I don't, I, I, let me be clear. I, don't, I think ISIS really isn't an al-Qaeda franchise. My concern is that there are lots of <coughs> existing groups that once affiliated themselves with al-Qaeda that now want to associate themselves with ISIS. That's my worry, is that the franchise phenomena will rebound to ISIS's benefit and sustain it much like it is done with al-Qaeda. So that's the point. Um, I mean, you're right. The, ISIS's, I think, ability to harness and to exploit social media is really something that uh, has been uh, uh, nothing less than a phenomena. I mean, we're always, I think, in the West, even though we invent all these technologies, we're always caught on our back foot when we see how our adversaries are so adept at exploiting them. And that feeds into your question about whether the Western media is hyping them. I mean, I go back to the point I said to Bilal uh, earlier, is that sometimes we're led by the nose by these terrorist groups. I mean, terrorism is always a strategy of provocation in any event. And Bilal's first question to, to Bruce Rydell about 9-11, I mean, obviously that was a strategy of provocation, provoked the United States. That was, if Al-Qaeda didn't deal this blow that you know, would be so dramatic, that would completely neutralize US foreign policy. Bin Laden hoped that we would invade. Just like Baghdadi and ISIS is constantly saying, you know bring them on. I mean, they want the idea of a US intervention because that will only both inflate their power but give them the opportunity they see to engage and, and ultimately weaken a superpower. I don't see it as much as, I, I think the media becomes responsive to what's in the news, always. And I'm not saying that either good or bad, and ISIS is in the news. But that's the second point. ISIS dominates the news because I think of the effectiveness of its communication and its very effective and opportunistic use of social media, which is also fed into its recruitment. I think the big question is, how long will this phenomena be sustained, or can it be sustained, or is there any effective way to counter it? But it seems like we're way behind the curve, at least their exploitation of this. And they're also, and don't forget, they're aping of, of tried and true propagandistic methods that Al-Qaeda pioneered, like online magazines, going back to the Camp al-Batar magazine well over a decade ago, but to Anwar al awlaki and Inspire, and now we have Dabiq, which everybody's talking about. But it's all, again, presentation and, uh, and dissemination that, 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 that has become so important. And social media has definitely facilitated that. Unless you want to add? OK. Let me try to go in the back. Uh, the gentleman with the glasses, please. Thank you. I'm uh, Will Embry from DynCorp International. Uh, Bruce, do you have any indications that uh, Saudi Arabia, in its leadership of its 10-member uh, international coalition, has any strategy uh, beyond just bombing? We have two Bruces. There's I think Bruce, this, right? this was a clear Rydell question. Uh, that was a plural Bruce. <laughs> and I know Will from many, many years of collaboration. Um, well, that's, it's a six, that's the $64 million question today. Uh, there appears to be a substantial gap between Saudi Arabia's uh, professed goal and objective, uh, which is to at least defend the Hadi regime, if not restore it to office, uh, and the means at their disposal, uh, which so far is an air campaign. Uh, as, as Americans, we are well aware of the limits of air power. Um, uh, it can do a lot, uh, but you cannot hold territory with air power. Um, the other problem the Saudis seem to have is finding someone who will provide a uh, experienced ground force for this mission. Although they profusely deny it, uh, the record, I think, is pretty strong that Saudi Arabia was asking Pakistan to provide such a ground force uh, in the month immediately before the beginning of Operation Decisive Shield. Uh, and the Pakistanis said no. Now, Pakistanis said no in a very circular way. Uh, you know, they always began by saying, we are the closest supporters of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia in the world, and if there is any threat to Saudi Arabia, we will be there. But we think the Yemen salute problem should be resolved through peaceful dialogue and by maintaining the unity of the, of the Islamic world. 
the last part of which is code word for we don't want to take the Iranians on. Uh, we don't want to be seen to be tilting towards uh, the Sunnis in a very sectarian conflict when 20 to 25 percent of our population are Shias. So they didn't, they have not gotten Pakistan. Uh, they may be able to get Egypt to provide ground troops. Of course, they have their own ground troops as well. Um, the last time Saudi ground troops went to war against the Houthis was in 2009, and it wasn't a very uh, satisfying outcome for the Saudis. Uh, the Saudi uh, commander of that uh, war, um, Khalid bin Sultan, uh, essentially saw his star collapse in the Saudi uh, princely system uh, and has never recovered from that. I think the, the Saudis now are in a box. Um, they may come up with an old solution that uh, we've used as well in the past, which is at some point to announce that the military campaign has succeeded in degrading uh, the military capability of the enemy <coughs> sufficiently that we can now say the campaign is over. Um, We've done that. A lot of people thought we should do that in Vietnam back in the 1960s. Uh, it is an exit strategy. It is not an entirely satisfactory exit strategy since everyone can see that degraded or not degraded, the Houthis are still in Sana'a and Aden uh, and you're not. The Saudis have a tough, tough decision to make right now. and. Uh, uh, go back to the Minister of Defense. Uh, I wouldn't want to be in his shoes with his level of experience in trying to make this kind of decision. The good news is uh, Mohammed bin Nayef, the Minister of Interior, is a much more experienced person uh, and probably providing uh, a very thoughtful input. Uh, but as we have discovered bitterly, it is easy to get into wars. It is awfully hard to get out of them. We try to get Two questions. Uh, the gentleman with the purple tie and then the lady with the green sweater. Thank you. Uh, Hugo Rosemont from the War Studies Department at King's College in London. And if I may slightly tweak the moderator's last question with regards to the effectiveness of, of partners and ask either panelists or ideally both about the effectiveness of the UK and European contributions to the addressing the threat that you've been speaking about today. Thanks. Excellent. And Mary Nautaway with the Wilson Center. Uh, Jabhat al Nusra has just taken over either. Do we attach any particular significance to that? Is this the beginning of, uh, of a comeback of a Jabhat al Nusra, which was much stronger at the beginning of the war in, uh, in Syria? Or is this just that they had an opportunity and seized it? Do you want to take that first and then sure. Bruce, you'll get the uh, second one? Once again, I think in the, in the very unsettled realm of the Levant, it's, it's too soon to tell. I'm sure that it was driven pr primarily by opportunism, but their ability to seize uh, that territory and the ability to hold on to it, I think especially their ability to hold on to it, um, will probably suggest whether they're coming back. They've been degraded in the contest against ISIS, but again, I think it's a huge mistake to say that they're completely neutralized or that they don't matter. Um, these things, unfortunately, are rarely uh, static and highly dynamic. I mean, two years ago, we would have been having a completely different conversation about Syria and about Javad al-Nusra, so it makes it very hazardous to talk about uh, the future. Um, briefly on the other question, you know, I mean, sort of a turning point in, let's say, you know, the. 2.0 or 3.0 version of the war on terrorism was, of course, the British Parliament's vote over Syria, which I think is certainly cast a shadow of events in the United States. I think it had uh, repercussions uh, far removed from uh, Westminster. Uh, the British military cutbacks, especially in the army, raise, I think, questions today that did not exist even five years ago, but certainly did not exist a decade and a half ago in terms of the kinds of cooperation and support the United States could call upon, and Britain was always dependable. There may have been another turning point a couple of years ago with the French intervention in Mali. It seems that, you know, oddly enough, that the U.S. and France are more on the same page on these issues uh, today. Uh, but, I mean, that underscores, I think, when 
there's a diminishment of US leadership. There's less of a desire to really do anything. And that becomes you know, absolutely central for the United States to be at least shaping the responses to terrorism worldwide and not leading from behind. Bruce, UK partner. Um, I just add one thing, which is the um, demise and the coming to the end of the NATO mission in Afghanistan. Um, has practical implications for cooperation between the United States and our NATO partners. While you, you may not regard the Afghan mission as a highly successful one, uh, one thing it did do was force a great deal of integration between the United States and NATO partners in, in planning how to send an expeditionary force to someplace very, very far away. It also meant a lot of integration of uh, intelligence, uh, logistics, and a generation of uh, NATO officers uh, who had uh, real, uh, in the trenches, combat experience together. Uh, that's coming to an end, and I don't see any chance that it's going to happen again in the foreseeable future. I think the net consensus of the uh, uh, NATO uh, capitals is uh, uh, one out of theater mission was one too many, and we're not going to do it anyway. And anyway, we've got a much bigger problem to worry about today, which is Russia and the Ukraine, which is a more traditional NATO mission. This is unfortunate for counterterrorism. Uh, cooperation uh, because, um, well, it wasn't the best counterterrorism effort in the world. It was an opportunity for uh, 26 allies to work together, and it's coming to an end, and I don't think it'll be replaced by anything else. And it applies directly to the UK, uh, where uh, we, uh, the British, were the second largest military force in. Afghanistan. Uh, it applies to the Canadians, who at one point had a very, very large force in Afghanistan and almost destroyed the Canadian military trying to sustain it. But it will also apply to smaller countries like uh, Poland, uh, who have, who have uh, sent troops and who probably won't have that combat experience again uh, in the foreseeable future. Let me take a couple more. Um, Gentleman here, and then way in the back. Hello, uh, Sean Peck, uh, Monterey Institute of International Studies graduate student. This is a question for Dr. Hoffman. Uh, I just want to know what your take was. Uh, when you started to research the people who make up the rank and file of the Islamic State, you start to see that former members of the Ba'ath Party, particularly uh, commanders within the foreign military, uh, pro take up prominent, prominent positions within the organization. I just want to know what your thought was on that, uh, what, the, what they bring to the table, and if they do buy into the ideology, given that they were a secular regime. Hold on one sec. And then way in the back, the lady. It's good to see you again. Um, hi, hi, I'm Nawaz from MP. My question is to Bruce Randall. You said Yemen is a mess. And um, I mean, I would venture to say the history of Yemen is a mess. But uh, my question to you is, the Saudis are introducing the sectarian card in Yemen when, if anything, Yemen is a tribal society, never been sectarian. Are we not concerned that that will complicate the situation in Yemen? Thanks. Briefly on Syria. I mean, yeah, and it's a very important point, I think. Um, I mean, I've always argued that religion has played a large part in the, the escalation of terrorism in the 21st century. And I still think for groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda, it's the glue that holds them together. It's the commonality and the common bond. But your question and my earlier point is that ideology seems to matter less these days, uh, that it's uh, the, the, I mean, it was a very shrewd move on the part of ISIS to enlist former Ba'athists, who were mainly secularists in any event, um, and to cap especially to capitalize on their military knowledge. I mean, the types of military operations that were done when they stormed into Iraq, I don't think a, a, a terrorist group or a guerrilla force or insurgent group could do. I mean, these were almost textbook military. Um, but again, I think it's the fluidity of the situation and the kinds of alliances that come together for a specific purpose. And, 
you know, the dominant narrative, of course, is you know, the Sunni-Shia conflict and the sectarianism, which has driven conflict not just in Iraq, but in Syria, certainly Lebanon and, and elsewhere. Yemen as well. I mean, this, this may yet become the dominant theme, although it hasn't been to date, but we see its emergence and the friction points becoming much sharper, largely because of sectarianism. And it shows that even long-term enmities are cast aside. Bruce, you didn't say enough about Saudi Arabia, so we thought I'd ask you another one. <laughs> Um, just mass is, of course, a very fancy political science term that I learned at the Kennedy School. Um, the Saudis didn't create the modern uh, sectarian conflict in the Middle East, uh, but they have been throwing gasoline on the fire. Uh, they've been doing that for some time, since the Islamic Revolution in, in Iran and the rise of Hezbollah. Uh, they have accelerated that considerably since uh, the Arab Spring in 2011 uh, for a number of reasons, one of which is they, they want to change the dialogue from uh, the question of political reform, uh, rule of law and accountability, uh, and democracy writ large to uh, a, a, a dialogue which is about which side are you on in the sectarian conflict? Uh, this was particularly important to do in Bahrain in 2011 by portraying the, uh, the democratic movement for change or the, uh, the movement for change as a stalking horse of Iranian imperialism and that all Shias were Iranian stooges. You changed what happened in uh, in Bahrain in a way which uh, was much more acceptable uh, to the uh, Saudi uh, internal situation and uh, in time much more acceptable to the United States as a solution. And I think we're seeing the same thing happen in Yemen today. That is not to say that the Iranians aren't also throwing gasoline on this fire. Uh, they've been doing it for a very, very long time. Uh, it ends up producing some uh, very odd uh, things uh, because it's, you know, you're playing with people's emotions and their religion, so you, you're going to create very uh, strange things. And the one that comes to my mind is that the, uh, there was a, uh, a blog the other day that showed a picture of the Saudi Minister of Defense, who I've talked about, uh, Prince Salman, next to a picture of Saddam Hussein, and both of them are on the telephone, and the caption on the bottom of it is, these two men know how to kill Shias. Now, being portrayed as a Saddam lookalike in Saudi Arabia is usually not a very effective way to get popularity, but it shows how the sectarian conflict uh, begins to uh, distort uh, analysis and leads to a, a conflict which is irreconcilable. You can't really reconcile it. It becomes like the 30 Years' War. And I guess the United States doesn't want to be the firefighter anymore. We are strikingly absent in speaking out about uh, sectarian violence, whether it's in Iraq or Pakistan or anywhere else, which is an issue which I actually think shouldn't be very hard for us to say. You know, we think that you shouldn't kill yourself over the question of who should have succeeded uh, the third caliph. I mean, we don't really have a game in that battle, do we? I'm not sure. All right, uh, the gentleman over there and then over here, please, and then the lady. We'll take three, actually, at the same. Sir, uh, my name is Mohammad Umar. I'm, I am a Pakistan inspector. My question to Mr. Bruce Tredel. Uh, what do you suggest the Pakistan army? Should they come to the rescue of Saudi Arabia, particularly in the backdrop of uh, fight against terrorism internally in Pakistan and on Afghan border? Thank you. The gentleman over here. Uh, George Pesky, I'm a Atlantic Council board member. Um, I'm amazed that uh, there haven't been more terrorist acts in the United States since 9-11. And uh, from what you've said, I think that's largely thanks to the uh, 
cooperation and help of our the intelligence services of our partners in, in the Middle East. That, their number, from what you're saying, and their reliability is fast waning. Um, sounds to me like that leaves us um, on our own. My question to you is, to either of you, or to both of you, is uh, what is our capacity, our capability, to uh, ferret out, intercept, and uh, stop terrorist acts on our own here in the United States, in the homeland. Um, do we have that capability, or, or what's your assessment of that capability? Do we have a growing likelihood of a major terror act? And it seems to me some terror acts would be awfully easy to do. I mean, you know, you've got the reservoir road going out to the water reservoir, right? And you just dump some stuff in there, and that's a major terror act. It doesn't require hundreds of people, hundreds of thousands of dollars. You can drop anthrax on Pennsylvania Avenue and just uh, depopulate the town for at least uh, months. Um, you can go on and on. What's your view, please, on, your, on the, our capability to intercept and stop uh, terrorist acts on our own without relying on partners? Okay, well, let me take one more with the lady in green over here. Hi, <clears throat> sorry, Channing May, Global Financial Integrity. Um, this is for both of the Bruces. Um, how important is terrorist financing to the quote unquote success of a terrorist group as compared to ideology? And <clears throat> I'm sorry, um, with ISIS, they, their financing is a bit different from Al Qaeda. Um, they are relying more on criminal operations. How, I wouldn't say how would you go about, but what are some options in terms of combating their, um, their financing, particularly oil theft? Right, so we have Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, uh, ability to protect the homeland on our own, and then finances. Do you want to start with Pakistan, Bruce? Um, I, I, think you, I, I think the notion of a ground war to uh, reinstate the Hadi government in uh, Sana'a is a recipe for a quagmire. Um, I think Prime Minister... Uh, Nawaz Sharif and Chief of Army Staff General Rahil Sharif recognize that. Uh, they have enough on their plate as it is. Um, the history of foreign armies uh, trying to uh, impose order on Yemen is not a particularly attractive one. Uh, as Gamal Abdel Nasser learned to his great regret. Uh, the Saudis have a problem. A ground war could make the problem they have today look uh, much smaller. Uh, and they might wish that they'd done what I'd said earlier, declare victory and look for a political solution. Um, the... Uh, I'll just say one word about the, the finances question. Um, this is an area where we've spent a lot of time, and I think there are demonstrable successes. But I go back to what I said about 9-11. According to the 9-11 Commission report, it cost a half a million dollars. That's just not very much money. I think the British government, after the 2005 attack, came to the conclusion that attack had cost less than 3,000 pounds. 8,000 pounds. Um, the best financial disruption strategy in the world uh, is going to have a hard time stopping a $12,000 operation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Gentleman's question on the... And I'll come back to finance, yep. too. I mean, that's... You know, I think the lines in terrorism now have blurred so much between domestic and international because of what we call the lone wolf phenomena, which isn't really a lone wolf. I mean, because these people are inspired, motivated, ultimately animated to carry out violence by external terrorist groups as part of their strategy. So I don't think we can consider that completely separate. I mean, this suggests that you know you can, we can't do it alone; that we're dependent on the information we get from overseas. Uh, think of the three terrorist incidents of the past six years, and I mean the actual incidents. Fort Hood we missed with Nadal Hassan, even though there were communications bet between him and uh, Anwar al-Awlaki that didn't trigger the right warnings. Faisal Shahzad, 
was a knucklehead in terms of building the bomb, but he got awfully close. And even in a place like, I mean, that to me is one of the, the most worrisome developments. Because if you had to pick any place in the United States to carry out a terrorist attack, I would say New York City, because of NYPD's reputation, and Times Square especially, which everybody knows. I mean, it's flooded with police. There was a police car across the street from the SUV that Shazad parked there. But it wasn't the authorities that disrupted that. It was his own stupidity and then two street vendors. And then, of course, the Tsarnaev brothers, when we did have information from a foreign intelligence source, but again, it wasn't acted upon properly. That's not to criticize the United States law enforcement or intelligence community, but to underscore how diff difficult it is and how much we are dependent on foreign sources for information. Even the, as the FBI would call it, the domain awareness <coughs> that the Pakistani Taliban would conceivably attack in the United States. I don't think that was so far-fetched because a year before there had been a very serious plot disrupted in Barcelona, for example. Um, I think, so I think, yes, domestically we are much better. Bruce discussed that. Certainly the overhauls that we've seen in the intelligence community, as I described the fact that three at least key agencies understand that this dynamic threat that they have to change, I think that's all heartening. But it's always going to be dependent on the quality of intelligence that we're also getting from overseas. There, I think one has to say the revelations of Edward Snowden have not helped. I think it's made other countries more distrustful of the United States in sharing information. But it's also degraded some of our own capabilities and also has instructed our adversaries in how to do things more efficiently. So I worry very much about uh, that. Uh, two other points. One is, you know, we don't, and this, is, and this is not to malign our Canadian allies, because Canada is very much aligned in the war against terrorism with the United extremely cooperative, and also, and has been since 9-11, extremely worried about the consequences of any attack in the United States that emanates from across the border, for obvious reasons. Trade, the, I mean, it's historically perhaps the two most open borders in the world. I find it very worrisome, because Canada thus far has produced exponentially more foreign fighters that have left Canada to join either ISIS or Jabhat al-Nusra than the United States has. And Canada has a tenth of the population of the US. So there's something of a disproportion. And of course, 80% of Canada's cities are within 10 miles of the United States. So that population mass, I mean, that's a threat. And that's a threat the Canadians are perfectly aware of. So we have to also not just be concerned about homegrown plots or lone wolves animated or motivated in the United States, but also even across the border. And then lastly, the other thing that does concern me, uh, which may strike something of a discordant uh, note, but given that we're at, what is it, this, approaching the second anniversary of the Boston Marathon bombing, I think we're less resilient than we were before. Um, you know, look, two idiots, and that's basically what they were, these two brothers managed to paralyze an entire city, to close down the entirety of Boston and the suburbs, to shut down Logan International Airport. Uh, at least to my knowledge, our British allies, German allies, Israel, the French, the Belt, when they're confronted by terrorist threats. I mean, this was a very, I think, very revealing reaction on our, on our part. And what worries me about it isn't so much our reaction, but the message that it communicated, that basically if these two idiot brothers can do this, when the real professionals in Khorasan Group or elsewhere, when they see the impact that, you know, three people is very different from 3,000. Tremendously tragic, all the injuries and deaths in Boston. But that was of a completely different magnitude than a 9 11 type of operation. And your question, why don't they do other things? On the one hand, we can say historically, fortunately, thriller writers and Hollywood producers have had richer imaginations than the terrorists. But these types of attacks that would kill en masse, they realize gosh, if the two brothers can elicit this response with a very modest number, tragic number of, 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 of casualties, what they could achieve, which I think you know, is one reason why terrorism may not work, but now we see why it's attractive, because at least in terms of generating attention and creating fear and anxiety, which is the heart of terrorism, in provoking some response from governments that terrorists hope will benefit themselves, interventions or invasions or whatever, you can see why terrorism has persisted. In terms of the financing, I think we did a great job with sort of the previous version of terrorism financing, but it's changed and altered. And I don't believe groups like ISIS, I mean, you're right, they, the illicit oil supply is one of them. They're kidnapping some of them. But they're still getting lots of funding from sympath wealthy sympathizers and patrons in other countries. And our ability to staunch those flows and also to interdict the logistical dimensions of terrorism, I don't really, I think it's the old version we were very good at, it's changed now, and we're not as good. Otherwise, we wouldn't see these groups thriving the way they do. 
Thanks, Bruce. Well, we're running out of time, but before I finish, I want to give a chance for both of you, 30 seconds, final thoughts on the subject. Bruce, you want to start? Well, uh, my wife always uh, urges me to not send all of you out to the bar. Um, I think there is uh, two reasons not to do that. One, as we've, we've, I think, said, our defenses here are better than they used to be. They are not foolproof. Uh, they cannot prevent uh, two uh, idiots uh, all the time, but our defenses are better. And secondly, I think that and it kind of builds on Bruce's point about resiliency. Um, we are going to be dealing with this problem for a long, long time. And it is a serious problem. And it is a, it is a very serious threat to our country, our national interests. But let's not exaggerate it totally out of proportion. And certainly, let's not make the fatal mistake of giving up our values in the process of fighting it. We do not need to torture people. We do not need to take away our right to privacy. We should reopen the United States Congress. The US Naval Academy should have the courage to let Americans back inside the facility. Same at West Point. Come on, if the, most, if the next generation of American sailors Marines and Army can't defend themselves, I think we've got a big problem here. So let's recognize the enormity of the challenge, but not lose some perspective here about uh, how we protect ourselves against it. Well, I would, I would agree entirely, and I think that's, that's absolutely right. But I think achieving that means looking at the threat clearly and unemotionally. I mean, is, terrorism is designed to el elicit a response. What terrorists are trying to elicit is a very emo emotional, irrational response. But that also means, again, recognizing that this is a problem that we can precipitously de declare victory over, that it's becoming, I would argue, more complex, more geographically diverse, perhaps even more threatening, at a time when we have fewer resources to get dedicated against this problem, which I think really, um, emphasizes the need for two things, to look at the problem clearly and objectively, uh, not, and see the world as it is, not as we might wish it to be. And I think that was one of the biggest problems in the Arab Spring, which is certainly, we, everybody thought, and I wish this were the case, that you know, a thousand flowers had bloomed, democracy had taken hold across North Africa and the Middle East, and the world became a more peaceful place. There were those, Bruce Rydell and myself amongst them at many forums, that said, we hope all of that, but this is also a tremendous opportunity for terrorists to take advantage of the upheaval, and in some places, the chaos. And that's exactly what we've seen, unfortunately. So that's my point about looking at it um, very clearly and, and very objectively. And then I think we, that's what we require to ultimately be successful. I mean, my dream would be to depoliticize the issue, and that's what worries me the most, is that terrorism, as I said, has gotten more complex, more geographically diverse, more threatening, but it's also become much more politicized than it was a decade and a half ago. And that really, I think, does compromise our ability to respond effectively to it. Well, this was terrific. Uh, please join me in thanking both Bruce's, and we'll see you soon, hopefully.